Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Stephen Jurd. I'm going to do a talk today about addiction in the brain. It's part of a series of four talks. We're doing the reward pathway today, and then in subsequent sessions we do one on genetics, uh, addiction in the brain, and one on evolution addiction in the brain, and one on recovery addiction and the brain. The idea is, I'm a doctor. Like most doctors, I have an opinion. I have an opinion about lots of things, but as a, as a doctor who's worked for over 40 years in the addiction field, I have thought, I have pondered, I have scratched my head on numerous occasions, what is going on with this person? What is it all about? What, what's happening with the relapses? Why did this person drink themselves to death? Why did that man say, nah, I don't need to see you, doc. I'm on top of this and he didn't even make it out of intensive care. Didn't even make it out of intensive care. He was still certain that he was in control and everything was fine. And so I've had those sort of bothers across my career. And then I stumbled on the doctor's opinion in the AA Big Book. And the AA Big Book, Dr. Silkworth in 1938 says, it's not just a mental illness. There's a physical component to it as well. He called the physical component analogy. Nah, it doesn't stand up to, non, to 2020's scrutiny very closely. But is there a physical component to addiction? That's the question. Excellent question that Dr. Silkworth proposed. He said, he answered it. He said, I think there is. I think there's a physical component. If you're in the city retreat and you're staying here, you're thinking, <sighs> these people are telling me to stop drinking altogether, forever. Can I handle that? And so the question is, what would motivate you? Now, if there's a doctor's opinion back in 1938 that says you've got something physical wrong with you, as well as something mental wrong with you, like, oh, okay. But how does that bear to scrutiny now in 2022? And that's what these talks are about, about the things that I've learned across my career, across the last 40 years, about the reward pathway, genetics, evolution, and recovery with their respect to the brain. Let's talk about the reward pathway. Let's do a brain here. It's looking out that way. And here you've got a, a brain stem, etc. Way down deep in the brain, way down in here, through here, way down deep, is the reward pathway. And it's old reptilian, that's why we talk about evolution later. It's, it's an old, old part of the brain. Let's zoom in on it. It goes from one abstruse place in the brain to another. It goes from the locus cerealis to the nucleus accumbens. It's a part of the brain that influences other parts of the brain. That's what it does. And it runs on dopamine. Dopamine. Okay, from one part of the brain to another. And the way neurons work in the brain is something triggers this one and it sends an electrical impulse down the track. And then at the other end, there's little vesicles, little packets, and the electrical impulse disturbs the packets and the packets spit out, on this occasion, the dopamine. Goes into there and then it fires it off. Now when your reward pathway fires off, it goes, wow! What was that? That was amazing. I really want to know more about that thing that happened. That mango that was in my mouth. Oh my God, that tasted good. I'm going to remember that. Perhaps that first time you got intoxicated. Maybe it was that good that good that you'll always remember it, even if you forget it. We'll come back to forgetting if we've got a chance later. 
and Michael Jackson. So yeah, so the, the reward pathway is that part of the brain that says something really good just happened. Remember that, focus on it because you want it to happen again. So it's a primitive reptilian decision-making system. It evolved early in the evolution of the brain and so it helps lizards to decide not many big decisions in a, in a lizard's life. Oh, it's nice to lie here in the sun, this feels good. But I'm a little bit hungry. And I see that insect that, insect that I ate once and I remember it was really good. It's worth moving to get the insect. Helps it to make that decision. So it remembers things from before and the good feeling of its belly being full. That's what it's for naturally. So that's the physiology of it. There, there are some alcoholics in the room, I believe you. Okay, okay. Well, show of hands, we, we got some alcoholics in the room. Good, good. You might remember your early recovery and, some, and a lot of patients have described to me over years that something happened that somebody just pulled up a veil, a filter, and the world wasn't black and white anymore. There were colours. Maybe your first spring in sobriety, when you smelt the flowers, when you, when you saw the sun come out again and you felt good, and it's like, I can feel good without the poison I've been poisoning myself with for years. Yes, I'm seeing nodding heads. Yeah, yeah, okay. So th this is a really common phenomenon. This is your reward pathway and its physiology. This is feeling good the normal way. So what happens the abnormal way? It's a tonic pathway, which means that there's always a steady little stream of dopamine going down. So even in the most boring of lectures by Dr. Jerd, you still got your attention a little bit just in case I come up with something good, just in case I surprise you. There's always a little dribble of dopamine. So it's like a car going down a gentle incline. And if a car's going down a gentle incline, there's two ways you can make it go faster and make the dopamine rush this way. And that is by putting your foot squarely on the accelerator or by damaging the brakes. This is the first thing that the reward pathway explained for me. It's like, ah, oh, look, you've got brakes on the side here. And if you damage those brakes, and that's what all the sedative drugs do. The downers like alcohol, uh, heroin, barbiturates, they damage the brakes. Take off any block to the flow of dopamine, more dopamine, more attention. Oh wow, that's amazing. That flows. And the other way is the uppers put their foot squarely on the accelerator and they increase the flow of dopamine with the accelerator. Now, when I started in addiction, they had all the drugs in different camps, including that cocaine wasn't even addictive. <laughs> really, really. They said it wasn't addictive because they hadn't well enough defined the withdrawal from cocaine. And they said, oh, drugs only addictive if there's a withdrawal. No, 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 no. Now we know it's about the reward pathway and it's about that sense of wow that you get out of the reward pathway. This explains why people who've become dependent on one drug, alcohol, might switch to another drug, ice or cocaine, to get the same thing. Or perhaps even more often, vice versa. So young people become addicted to ice or, uh, or cocaine and then go, oh, I've got to change my way of life. I'll just go, I'll go straight street and I'll just drink. And they find they've trained the reward pathway and they're back to doing the same thing. So this reward pathway explains switching from one drug to another. The reward pathway and its function. And it explains why 
there's so great commonalities between the different types of drugs. But the abstinence states, the craving, the, the things that you'll do to get your special substance are similar across different groups of drugs. So cocaine, a cocaine addict and a heroin addict might engage in a conspiracy to get money for their favourite drug and be able to cooperate perfectly well and engage in the same sort of crimes and uh, or the same sort of drug dealing, whatever, whatever, whatever. They'll do that, but they're not completely different categories of people. They're just people who've trained their reward pathway to respond to different chemicals. And this explains the very old phenomenon of switching one drug for another and why so many AA members pass on the wisdom to more junior AA members, watch out, watch out. No, please don't go for the cannabis-led recovery. You know, that, that, that goes to bad places. I've seen it a lot of times before. So it explains switching. The other thing it explains is taking a sedative and a stimulant together. And when I'm talking to the guests here at the Sydney Retreat, I ask, um, has anybody ever heard of that? of some people who take a sedative and a stimulant at the same time. Has anybody ever heard of it? Maybe you've heard some field researchers and there's always a lot of chuckling and people go, you know, because they've done it themselves. And it's a standard thing now. Now at the level of consciousness, if you're just trying to, if you think, oh, I'm taking this drug because I want to sedate myself and that that's my rational reason for doing it. Sometimes they say, oh, my rational reason for taking cocaine on that is to perk myself up a little bit because I'm a bit too sedated or something, whatever. What's actually happening is deep down here in the reward pathway, you've damaged the brakes well enough and so now to make it flow a little bit more, you put your foot on the accelerator as well. And so the two drugs are synergistic. They act together additively. So the physiology of this reward pathway explains switching drugs and it explains adding apparently opposite drugs one to another. The other thing that we need to talk about in terms of the reward pathway, so we talked about its physiology and how it's part of the, the, the reward system inside the brain that fires off when we see a relative. We see someone we love. We see one of our best mates. We smell dinner. And we remember, oh, I know what that is. That sm smells just a bit like mum's roast lamb. Oh, that's good. And you get that good feeling, right? That good memory. That's been ingrained from the first time you really enjoyed a, uh, uh, a good baked dinner. And so that is the physiology. Now, the, the 30 second uh, lesson in pharmacology now. <laughs> okay, so what's the point of doctors prescribing drugs? The point of doctors prescribing drugs is to fight against physiology and sometimes pathology. Blood pressure is a really good example. Typically, people get high blood pressure because year upon year upon year, they're just a little bit too fired up, they're stressed, and their autonomic nervous system is working harder, and eventually they come to a bad equilibrium where to get through life, their heart's pumping just a little bit harder, their blood pressure's up. And what do doctors do about that? They take your blood pressure, go, oh, your blood pressure's up a little bit. Mm, we've got to do something about that script. Here you go. Turns it off. That long-term, physiology or pathophysiology, the, the sickness of the body, is defeated. So pharmacology defeats physiology. That's the point. That's the point of all prescribing. There's something in your body that's happening and I'm gonna prescribe this. You're experiencing pain. You need aspirin. The pain in your tooth, there's the receptors are being stimulated by prostaglandins. And they're going, ee, and they're saying, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. Pain, 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 do something about it. You take an aspirin, 
it interferes with that process of the prostaglandin stimulating the, uh, the nerve cell. Then you don't feel it anymore. Hooray, we love aspirin when we've got a toothache. And the pharmacology defeats the physiology. Okay, like that's the point. That's the whole point of prescribing a drug that works. It can change the way the body functions. So what's happening in the reward pathway then when we flood the reward pathway with ice, with cocaine, with alcohol, with benzodiazepines. We're flooding it. What happens is the pharmacology overwhelms the physiology. And if you remember the time when you were drinking, you didn't get much pleasure, much joy, didn't pay much attention to anything other than your substance. So what happens, back to the reward pathway, and you put your foot squarely on the accelerator, you damage the brakes, you've got the flow, the dopamine's happening down here, dopamine's flying down here, extra, 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 yes, feels good, floods each and every one of these receptors on the other side, they're all full. Yes, it's amazing. What does the body do in response to that? It develops more receptors. The body wants to find a new balance. It goes, what, 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 what? And so you get more and more receptors and the original dose that was effective isn't effective anymore. And so then you go to the next level and then the next level and then the next level. And at the end of all of that, you get frustration. And I've had many patients say to me, I can't even get drunk anymore. I can't even get drunk. I'm drinking and drinking and drinking and... <sighs> And so that's because the receptors have multiplied and that's, that's the mechanism of tolerance. So the more dopamine you pour on, it just soaks it up. So then when, when you stop drinking or drugging, these fellows are hungry. They're saying, I used to be flooded. I haven't got any, where's my stimulus? Where, where, how can I feel good? How can I possibly feel good again? And so that's part of the drive to drink. And so, and this is the, the mechanism of tolerance and the way that pharmacology wins out over physiology and you get a new balance. And this is in a crucial part of the brain for learning. Artificially, the whole point of drugs, so any drug that's worth, that's got street value, increases the concentration of dopamine in this tiny little cell, it's two millimetres thick, this tiny little spot, but it's got connections to the rest of the brain that says, wake up, something great just happened. What we do when we take drugs is we convince that part of the brain artificially that something good just happened. Something good didn't happen. You just had a drink or a drug but your brain becomes convinced that something good just happened because you've artificially stimulated this pathway. Isn't that weird? So, so addicts and alcoholics are constantly in the process of tricking themselves into saying something good just happened when nothing happened but they took a substance. That artificially convinces the brain that there's something going on. So this ends up in an ongoing cycle round and round and round and round. Now these, I've made a note to myself here, it's in the lizard part of the brain, in an evolutionary sense, a very old part of the brain, you know, humans have only been around for 200, 300,000 years, but lizards were around 100 million years ago and their memories aren't real good. So what we call our memories, we sometimes lose them when we're intoxicated and we black out and drinking. Why is that good? How can that be good? This is where poor Michael Jackson died from propofol. 
an anesthetic agent, you know, the ones that they, that they shoot you up with and they say count backwards from 10 and you never make it past seven, that one, or they're barbiturates or like barbiturates, they're highly addictive drugs. And occasionally uh, I've, I've treated some anesthetists who've become dependent on this drug. They've become dependent on a substance that induces unconsciousness almost immediately. Now, most addicts and alcoholics convince themselves that they've got an experience, they've had an experience, that, that, that that's what they really like and that they remember that experience and that's what I want and so on. But in fact, what you're doing is tickling up this deep, dark part of the brain, inaccessible, doesn't speak English, doesn't come when it's called, it's a bloody reptile. Don't trust them. Don't trust reptiles. Don't trust this part of your brain because it's functioning when your memory isn't. The alcoholic blackout, people are, you know, walking around, apparently conscious, but can't remember any of it because the memory parts of the brain are out unconscious. But the walking part of the brain, maybe even the talking part of the brain, is still working after a fashion. And people who become addicted to these anaesthetic agents don't rem remember the experience much at all, but still want it. They still want it. So there's this wanting part of the brain that's deep in there that's inaccessible. If it's inaccessible and if it's been altered, well then there's sort of no way out. All you're really left it with is how do I stop stimulating it altogether? How do I leave that bloody part of the brain alone Nothing, nil, no alcohol. And this is the point that Silkworth was trying to make back in 1938, saying, treat it like an allergy. Your reaction to this substance is so bad, you don't want to be in the same room as it. You could get uh, anaphylactic shock. It could kill you. So treat it like that. And so that's the point of doing this talk here at the Sydney Retreat, to get people to understand that there is actually something physically different yeah. inside their brain that's been altered. Over time, when you stop using, even in the short term, people notice you start to see colours again, you start to enjoy uh, seeing a friend and so on. And it changes, and we talk about that in the recovery session that I'll talk about later. So today we've spoken about the reward pathway and the reward pathway helps us to understand that there's a part of the brain that gets trained to love drugs and that that part of the brain is inaccessible to our higher thinking and our best intentions. In the next session, we'll talk about genetics. Thank you.